Greetings everybody and welcome back to another complex analysis console integration video. For the usual viewers you might notice that we're doing things a little bit differently here. We have a black digital whiteboard going on so it's a bit of a combination of my two usual styles of doing things on the whiteboard and going to uni and filming on the blackboard. So let me know if you guys even like this sort of format and this might be something I consider because it's quite a lot easier doing things digitally um, than having to write things out physically and whatnot. Yeah, so let me know down in the comments. Anyways, today we're doing this integral, um, integral from zero to infinity of log squared of x over x squared plus one. I believe this integral has been done a few times using complex analysis on YouTube already. And I just wanna offer a slightly different approach, which also uses complex analysis. I remember seeing this technique on Stack Exchange and I can't remember the exact post or the exact problem it was, um, but I tried applying it to the integral and it turned out working out quite nicely. Probably not the most efficient method to solve this integral, but it's still rather interesting, I guess. So usually when you solve this integral using complex analysis, you use some sort of semicircular contour with maybe an indent at zero because of the logarithm. But here we're going to use a keyhole contour, which is quite interesting. So let's draw out a keyhole contour. Okay, so we've gotten the console drawn here. We have the console C and it consists of this big part, the gamma that goes around. We have a little part, little gamma in there. We have a branch cut going up from zero because of the logarithm term. And then we have poles at plus or minus i because of the x squared plus one. And we're trying to wrap everything nicely around this branch cut. So we have these two paths, which I call psi one and psi two, which kind of go in and then back out. Now we've gotten the contour, but I haven't even told you guys what on earth the function is. So that's going to be a bit of a mystery for now. We're going to try to figure out exactly what the function is as we go along. Um, but what we're going to take the function to be is something over, well, z squared plus one is definitely going to go down there. Now, what's going to go on the numerator? Should we put a log squared of z perhaps? Well, that might be the obvious choice, but that's not a very good choice to make because it turns out if you use the key call contour, if we go out and then back on these two psi one and psi two paths here, you're going to get some kinds of a log squared of z term. And those are going to be cancelling each other out because we're going in opposite directions on those two paths there. So if you use log squared here, you're going to or lose the logarithm squared term, so you're not going to be able to recover the original integral i. So what people tend to use is they use a log cubed instead, so at least the log cubes will cancel out, and then you might pick up a log squared and then you can recover the integral i. But then if you do that, you're going to pick up a log term and then also a constant term, which not, you can deal with that if you want to, it's not too bad to deal with. But in this case, we want to try to think of some kinds of polynomial where we only need to recover the log squared term. So that's going to be, I guess, the mystery parts here. We're going to take some polynomial, which is going to be some cubic polynomial of a log of z. And we're going to try to figure out what exactly a suitable polynomial would be later on. But let's just take this as our function for now. So we can write down a few integrals. So first of all, we have the console integral over c of our function, and we can break this up into each of these separate paths. We have the integral over psi one, plus the integral over psi two, plus the integral over little gamma, and then big gamma. Now notice that the console integral over c, it encloses two poles at plus or minus i. So we better use Cauchy's residue theorem, and that's gonna be equal to two pi i, times the sum of the residues of the function f. Okay, so now it's, we're ready to evaluate some integrals and try to figure out what that mysterious polynomial p would be. So let's take a look at the integrals over psi one and psi two, because that's really where we're gonna be recovering the integral i there. So psi one and then plus psi two. One thing I forgot to mention as well is that we have this branch cut here. We do need to define some kinds of branch for that logarithm function. And we're just gonna take arg of z to be on the interval zero to two pi, like so. And in the limits, we're going to be taking r to infinity. So r is the radius of this big circle here and epsilon approaches zero, which is the radius of that little circle in there. And these two paths, psi one and psi two, we want them to be approaching each other. So we're basically squeezing against this branch cut. Okay, so let's take a look at the limits instead of when psi one and psi two approach each other. So I'll use this funny notation because I don't really know how else to write it. And of course, r approaches infinity and epsilon approaches zero. So it just limits everywhere pretty much. Um, what is this going to be equal to? Well, notice the integral over psi one, that's really going to become the integral that goes from zero to infinity. 
And how about the integral over psi 2? Well, we're going back from infinity to 0. So we're going to have a plus the integral going from infinity back to 0. And then we're going to be integrating our function f of z. So f of z has something over a z squared plus 1 and something over z squared plus 1. Now in the numerator, we do have to be a little bit careful because that logarithm inside of that polynomial will depend on how we choose to approach that branch cut because the logarithm in the complex world, we can write it in the following form and you can derive this quite easily. Log of z is equal to the log of the absolute value of z. So this guy, this is the real part and then you have a plus i times the argument of z. So this arg of z is in fact the imaginary part of the logarithm. And notice the imaginary part of the logarithm depends on the arg of z. And you know, that depends on how we approach that branch cut there. So what's going to happen on this top branch here? So this is the integral over sine 1. What's the arguments approaching as we approach the branch cut from the top? Well, the arguments approaching 0. So we have the polynomial of the logarithm but remember the logarithm in there we can write as log of absolute value of z plus i times the argument but the argument is just going to be approaching exactly zero so we have i times zero and how about on the second integral side two well we still have the polynomial of the logarithm and we write log of absolute value of z and then we have to do plus i times the arguments. Now, what's the argument going to be approaching if we come from below the branch cut? What's going to be approaching 2 pi? So we have the times a 2 pi in here. So as you can see, the logarithm will have a different value depending on if we approach above or below the branch cut. Okay, so let's simplify a few things over here. So what does all of this mess simplify to? First of all, I'm going to take these bounds here. I'm going to flip them around and as a result, introduce a negative sign out the front of the second integral. That way we can just add the two integrals together and add the inside. So this is going to be equal to the integral from zero to infinity. We have the polynomial P of log of Z. And then we have a minus the polynomial of log of absolute value of Z plus a two pi I. And all of this stuff is being divided through by z squared plus a 1 and we integrate with respect to z. We can even change these z's over here into x's if we want to because now we're just integrating on the real lines. Let's do that. We have an x, we have another x and then that z over there, that's also an x as well. Okay, so notice the integrals over psi 1 and psi 2, we can reduce it down into this form here and now this is where we can play around with what the polynomial might look like because what we really want this to be equal to, um, so we um, yeah wish over here, we wish for all of this to be equal to the integral i because if we can do that, um, well, we can play around with the residues and whatnot and get the answer right away. So the question is now, what polynomial should we pick in order for this whole entire numerator here to be equal to just a log squared of x, which is going to recover our original integral. And notice that x here, we're going from 0 to infinity, so we don't even need these absolute values. We can just have, well, just log of x by itself. So log of x, and then also log of x. Right, so now we have this first step done over here. So this was kind of step one, doing the calculation of those two integrals. Now we take a look at step two. So what exactly is our goal now? Our goal is to find some kinds of polynomial, which I call p, such that the following holds. We have a p of, now instead of logarithm here, I'm going to write that as a lambda. And we want to subtract a p of, and again, we have a lambda instead, plus two pi i, but instead of two pi i, I'm just gonna write, um, let's say plus some value k here. And we want this to be equal to, well, a lambda squared. But we can be a bit more general. We can say at least some constants c times lambda, because it doesn't matter if we have this constant c in there. Um, if as long as we manage to get lambda squared, we can factor out to the c, and then we can still recover our original integral i. Remember that this left-hand side is basically what we have in the numerator, and we really want that to simplify down to lambda squared so we can recover our original integral i. So let's try to find out what this polynomial 
P would be now. So in order to do that, well, first of all, P can't be a quadratic because these lambda squares are going to cancel out if you sub it in. So the next best thing you can do is you could try, say, a cubic. So we can try now to let a P of a lambda be equal to a monic cubic, let's say, so lambda cubed, and then plus some constant, so alpha times lambda squared, plus beta times lambda, and then you might say, well, plus gamma here as well, but you don't need to put that in gamma, it's a bit redundant, because you're going to be subtracting these two polynomials anyway, so the constants um, are just going to cancel out, so there's not really a point of putting it there. So we have p of lambda, okay, so let's try to calculate p of lambda plus k now. So what exactly is p of lambda plus k? You can try plug a lambda plus k into lambda cubed. That's going to give you lambda cubed and then plus a 3k lambda squared. And then we have a plus a 3 times k squared lambda and then plus a k cubed. Now what happens if you plug lambda plus k into this lambda squared? Well, we still have this alpha here, remember? So that's going to give us plus alpha times lambda squared and then the second term of the binomial expansion is 2 times lambda times k so that's going to give us 2 times alpha times k times lambda and then finally we have the final term is k squared so that's going to be alpha times k squared and then what happens if you plug this guy here into beta times lambda well that's going to give you plus a beta lambda and then plus a well, beta times k. Okay, so we have p of lambda plus k figured out. Let's do the subtraction now and compare coefficients. So if we subtract over here, what is going to happen? Well, on the left-hand side, we're going to get p of lambda minus p of lambda plus k. That's kind of what we're after. And on the right-hand side, the lambda cubes are going to cancel out. Um, we have alpha lambda squared and alpha lambda squared, which are going to cancel out, leaving us with a negative 3k lambda squared and how about on the next column here we have a beta lambda up over here which is going to cancel out down here leaving us with a i'm going to factor up the negative now 3k squared plus 2 alpha k times lambda and then finally for the constants what do we have we have k cubed oh there's no constants on the top here so we just have i guess it's k negative k cubed negative alpha k squared and then a negative beta k okay so now we can just compare coefficients because we really want all this to be equal to c times lambda squared so first of all that's just a quadratic on its own so this coefficient c over here we can match it up to negative three times k here now what else can we do we know that there's no lambda on the right hand side which means that this coefficient has to be equal to zero so now assuming k isn't equal to zero we can factor k out or divide k on both sides and we're going to be left with 3k plus 2 alpha is equal to zero or in other words if you try to rearrange for alpha alpha is this going to be equal to negative 3 on 2 times k. Okay, so we got alpha figured out, and finally, let's try to figure out what beta is. So beta is everything that's left behind here, so over here. So we also want a negative k cubed minus alpha k squared minus beta k to be equal to 0. But we already know what this alpha is over here. This alpha is going to be negative 3 on 2k, but because there's that extra negative there, we have a plus a 3 on 2 times k, um, but that's really going to give you k cubed here. So in particular, positive 1 half k cubed minus beta k is equal to 0, or you can just put the equality sign here. And again, assuming k is not equal to 0, what do we get from this equation? We get that beta must be equal to 1 half times k squared. Okay, so we basically figured out the polynomial we need now by comparing all these coefficients we're going to take the polynomial so therefore what we're going to do is we're going to take p of z or p of lambda rather to be equal to we have the lambda cubed at the very start and then we had alpha was negative 3 on 2k times lambda squared and then beta was positive 1 half k squared times lambda and then there was no constant. So that's our polynomial there. 
So if we use this polynomial here, what we can be sure of is that this relationship up over here holds. And if that relationship holds, that means in the numerator of this integral we just got here, we can be sure that it's equal to well, c times lambda squared. Now that lambda is just going to be logarithm squared of x. Now what exactly is c? c was equal to negative 3k. And what k value are we choosing here? Well, k is this going to be this 2 pi i. So in particular, in this case, we're going to get a c is negative 6 times pi times i. So that yellow box we had at the bottom there, that's going to be negative 6 times pi times i times the log squared of x which is really quite nice because now we can just factor out that negative 6 pi i we can put it out the front here and we still and we're able to recover our integral i which is really nice so what have we done so far we've evaluated these two integrals a psi 1 and a psi 2 both of these are going to give us negative 6 times pi times i times the integral i we want. Now just so I don't make this video too long, I'm not going to evaluate those. Those I'm going to leave as an exercise for you guys if you want to try to evaluate those because these are just going to go off to zero in the limits anyways. So now what's left for us to do is to evaluate this residue, these sum of residues. So I'm going to take this function over here and let's just bring that up to the top somewhere so we can see it. So we'll calculate the residue at z equals, now we'll do, I guess, plus or minus i, just to keep things fairly compact here, um, of f of z. So what is this going to be? Both of these guys are simple poles, so using the formula for the residues at simple poles, it's a limit as z approaches that specific pole, so plus or minus i, of z minus the pole. Now if you subtract a plus or minus, it just turns into a minus plus i, and then we have the p of our logarithm of z, divided by z squared plus 1, but we can rewrite this as z minus i, and then z plus i. Okay, so what happens if we cancel some things here? Now, if it's a positive case, we're going to be cancelling out these negative factors, and that leaves us with, well, just z plus i here, and if it's the negative case, it's the other way around. So we have the limit as z approaches plus or minus i of p of a logarithm of z divided by just going to be z plus or minus i like so. Okay, so if we plug in the value for z, nothing's going to blow up or anything. So this is going to be p of log of plus or minus i divided by, um, yeah, plus or minus 2i, depending on which case it is. So now let's try to figure out what log of plus or minus i is. Let's start with the logarithm of i. So log of i, because i can be written in the following form here, i is equal to e to the i times pi over 2, and it has to be pi over 2 because we're on the arguments range from 0 to 2 pi. What we can do is we can write this as an i times pi over 2. Now we're trying to apply the polynomial p to this, so let's do p of log of i, this is equal to p of i pi on 2, and we just needed to use the definition of this polynomial p here but i'm going to rewrite this first of all i'm going to factor out some lambda just so it's easier to plug in so we have lambda squared minus and now this k here that's going to be 2 pi i so that twos are going to cancel leaving us with a 3 pi i times a lambda and then we have a plus k is 2 pi i so swearing that gives a negative 4 pi squared and it's going to cancel up with that 2 slightly so that's going to give us a negative actually 2 times pi squared okay so plugging i pi into there what are we going to get it's i times pi on 2 and then we have that thing squared so i pi over 2 squared and then we have a negative 3 pi i times that lambda which was i times pi over 2 and then we have a negative 2 pi squared, like so. And we can simplify this, it's not too bad to do, even though it looks bad. We have negative pi squared on 4, then a positive, because we have two i's there, which is going to cancel out with that negative. That's going to be a 3 pi squared on 2, and then a minus, 
2 pi squared, but I'm going to rewrite that as 8 pi squared on 4. And that 3 on 2, I'm going to rewrite that as 6 on 4 times pi squared. And that's just so we can add these fractions together. So we have a negative 1 plus 6, which is 5 minus 8, which is negative 3. So that's i times pi over 2. And then a negative 3 pi squared on 4. And we can simplify this to being negative i times 3 pi cubed over 8 like so. So we have a p of a logarithm of i is equal to negative i 3 pi squared on 8 and we can do something similar for p of log of a negative i as well because p of log of a negative i let's do it up over here negative i is 3 pi and 2 instead and so we're just going to put, so there's a negative over here. We're just going to put threes everywhere now. So three, three, and we have a three here and a three here. And well, instead of just a negative one pi squared, it's going to be a negative nine pi squared. There's going to be a three out over here. And instead of a six, I believe that should turn into an 18 because three times three, that's nine now. And then we multiply the fraction by two. So 18 pi squared on four. And then we still have that negative 8 from before. That doesn't change. So what's negative 9 plus 18? That's positive 9 minus 8 is positive 1. So inside of this bracket here should just be a positive 1. And we still have that 3 out over there. And that's actually going to give us the same thing. But we don't have the negative sign here, which is quite nice. So P of log of negative i is just positive i times 3. 3 pi squared divided by 8. Okay, so we can plug these guys into the residues we had above over here. So this means that the residue at z is equal to i of the function f is going to be equal to negative i 3 pi squared on 8. Now if it's the positive case, we're going to divide by, that's going to be just positive 2i. So divide by 2i, and that's going to be equal to, the i's are going to cancel, leaving us with negative 3 pi squared on 16. And basically, the same thing happens with the z equals negative i of the function f. That's going to be positive i, 3 pi squared on 8, but we divide by negative 2i instead. And that's also going to give us a negative 3 pi squared divided by 16. Okay, so these are the two residues that we're working with here. And now what happens if we take the sum of the residues? So the sum of the residues of the function f is going to be equal to, well, that's just going to be equal to negative um, 6 pi squared divided by 16. And of course, a 2 pi i times the sum of the residues, which is really what we're after, that's going to be equal to well, first of all, I should have simplified that down to negative, what's that going to be? Um, 3 pi squared divided by 8. So now 2 pi i times that guy, that's going to be negative 2 pi i. And then we have a 3 pi squared on 8. Um, but the 2 and the 8 are going to cancel to give us a 4 down there. And then we are going to get a pi cubed instead. And then we still have an i and a negative, it seems like. And I also have a 3. Okay, so this is 2 pi i times the sum of the residues of our function. Why do we need that? Well, that's because it was on this left-hand side of this integral equation here. And notice that that's going to be equal to negative 6 pi i times our integral y, which is what we wanted. So if we equate all of this stuff over here to being negative 6 pi i times the integral i that we want, what are we going to get? Well, this is negative 3 pi cubed times i divided by 4 here. We just need to cancel a few things and put things over to the other side and whatnot. So first of all, the negatives are going to cancel. The i's are going to cancel, which is good. And this pi over here is going to cancel with that cube to turn it into a square. So overall, i is going to be equal to, we can bring the 6 down to the other side as well. That's going to be giving us about 1 over 6 times 3 pi squared divided by 4. But that's 3 pi squared divided by 24. And that's going to give us pi squared divided by 8 which is the final result for today's integral. So hopefully that wasn't too long of a video. I don't know how long I've been filming for, but um, yeah, that's basically the whole method there. Again, not the most efficient method, I'd say. 
mainly because we had to find this polynomial here then we just had to do all this messy arithmetic and whatnot and i forgot to label this step so this is more like step three finding the residues here and then we have um yeah step four which is plugging everything back in and then of course if you want you can have a step five which is um yeah the exercise for doing the integral over the gamma paths but yeah that's pretty much all for this video hopefully you guys found it somewhat interesting again let me know if you guys like this format and maybe i'll continue using this because it's a bit more efficient and i can probably make more videos using this format especially when i get back to doing uni and i'm always busy and whatnot uh, but yeah up until the next one have a wonderful day and i'll see everyone in the next video bye bye